So our next panel is going to tackle the big elephant in the room, especially in the middle of a difficult economy and stories every day in the news about austerity budgets, layoffs, and cutbacks. Who's going to pay for all of this e-health? It's one thing for us to get excited about concepts like telemedicine and devices that do everything from monitor our heart rates to help us diagnose sleep problems, but who's footing the bill? And how do we construct models that satisfy the needs of health systems and even governments while delivering care that truly is going to make a difference in the future? Our moderator is Colonel Matthew Holt. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Matthew has spent 20 years in healthcare as a researcher, generalist, forecaster, and strategist. He's conducted in-depth studies about the healthcare market, information technology, and policy for public release and private clients. And he learned from some of the best forecasting policy and survey organizations, such as Institute for the Future and Harris Interactive. But these days, he's best known as the author of the healthcare blog and as the co-founder of the Health 2.0 conferences, which this year alone will be held in New Delhi, Boston, Berlin, and San Francisco. At no, Las Vegas. <laughs> Take it Thank away. you so much, Jill. Great. Well, thanks to be with you all. I'm glad that my secret military career has now been outed. And uh, you know, I thought those special forces operations were kept quiet, but apparently they knew about them here at CES. I expect to see some saluting from all of you. <laughs> Um, and we're going to have a great panel, and it's a bit like, uh, you know, I'm English, so I know the, the, the Monty Python song, you know, which was about the money program, where Eric Idle starts singing about how wonderful money is, and uh, I would do the riff, the riff for you, but uh, we're here to talk about the, as I said, the elephant in the room, money, and I've got a, a great set of panelists, and as Jill said, I'm getting old now. Uh, those of you may have seen the research recently from England, which said that people above 45 are already starting to get memory loss, and, you know, so if I, if I lose my... Yeah, well, anyway, you get the picture, picture. No, but what's happening now is, is, is that uh, we're really seeing, you know, a, a big change in can we put digital to work to help the entire healthcare system in a healthcare system which is not, not used to this. As Jill said, I've been around in healthcare now for a little over 20 years, and actually it's just tremendously back to the future. So, and this panel represents that fantastically. So uh, um, on the far right, my, my friend Joe Kavadar, he is from uh, the Connected, Center for Connected Health of Partners. Um, Partners, of course, is the merger of Brigham and Women's. And about, not quite 20 years ago, but 18 years ago, Brigham and Women's and the Mass General merged uh, because back in those days, right, managed care was coming. It was going to be capitation. It was changing in payment. It was everything was all going to be different. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, you know, the, the Wags at Institute for the Future used to say that in fact it was two hospitals with a shared laundry service for many years, although now it's a much bigger and more solid organization. Um, coming to this end of the panel, we have uh, uh, um, uh, Bob Jarin. Sorry, Robert, go on. <laughs> Let's cut him. Um, Robert is, is from Qualcomm, and he's very involved both in regulatory affairs, but also is going to talk a little about the, uh, the financial side of investment. And I'm going back to uh, you know, those parties that were had. There was one of the startups, I can't remember which one it was, that like raised $27 million in 1998 or 99, had the big party in Vegas with the Who and you know, sort of uh, Quincy Jones playing, and, and then, of course, absconded with the rest of the money and actually never developed their product at all. <laughs> We're not quite back to those days yet, but we did see the announcement of a large fund from Qualcomm and a lot of excitement in this area about raising money. But there are still some health to companies recently in the last a few years who have raised money who are still struggling to find a market, struggling to find an identity, and some of them who are not around. And uh, both uh, Joe and, and Robert have been a bit involved in that. And then, of course, the other thing that's back to the future is when I came to this country um, back in the early 90s, um, I would get moved to San Francisco, and the local sports team uh, was a, a successful dynasty. Um, in fact, if you think about this, it's just back to the future. The Niners are finally in the playoffs again this coming week. We have a young coach just left uh, Stanford University, took over, and has turned the team into very successful. And if you think about it, go back to the uh, late 70s, early 80s, that was the same story. And the coach is here with us today. Here's Bill Walsh. <laughs> oh, sorry. Bill is uh, this is different. Bill. Bill is from ARP, Curl. which uh, <laughs> Bill is from ARP. ARP is, of course, the major um, uh, consumer association for uh, I would say retired people, but it's actually uh, down. You can be people fifty. Of your age. People of my age and above, <laughs> almost now, right? Um, and he has some great information about consumers. So let's dive in, and we're going to do this very interactively. A lot of uh, hopefully aggressive talking over each other here, and we want to hear from you very quickly. Um, so we'll be going to the audience uh, to, to run to the mic and, and grab questions. Um, and I was kind of really uh, um, impressed with sort of one thing that to put in context, which is that. 
There's a lot of uncertainty about whether this stuff saves money or not. I mean, Leslie Saxon gave an amazing talk this morning with Don Jones um, about you know, these amazing new devices and putting them on USC football players. I, I tweeted, and luckily it didn't go out because of the, the Wi-Fi, the, the cell isn't here, isn't working, that uh, Leslie was probably both, because she was saving people from, chronic, from sudden death, um, she was probably increasing healthcare costs and violating NCC, NCAA rules at the same time. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> we don't know whether all this stuff works, but the early impressions that we have, all the stuff that we're seeing downstairs, that Joe has a disconnected health conference, we, had health, we have at Health 2.0, all the stuff we work on, we think it's going to make a big difference, but we know that at the moment the system isn't set up to pay for it. So we're going to talk about how do you pay for it in a couple of different ways. And first I'm going to start with Robert, just to talk a little bit about, um, we heard a bit about this from Don this morning, but about two, two things which are going on in the world of Qualcomm. One is prizes, and one is uh, investments. So talk a little bit about how that level of paying, getting it off the ground with that type of payment. Sure, so I, I guess, can, you, can anybody hear me? Can, anybody can we get this mic up? <coughs> Hello? So I'm just gonna try to bellow that, okay, so. Can, can we get Robert's mic up? Yeah. Thank you. If not, we'll stop. Two things that Matt was talking about were uh, the $100 million venture financing fund. Uh, that Qualcomm announced with the creation of the wholly owned subsidiary called Qualcomm Life. We announced that back in December. And the second thing was the announcement that went out a couple days ago here, uh, made by Paul Jacobs of the Tri-Quarter uh, X, X Prize. There we go. Uh, so those two things, and, uh, and they're definitely uh, important in the, in the question of uh, e-health and who's paying the bill. Um, but I guess I'm going to come at it from, from a, a, a different approach, and I will talk about those two things, um, but briefly talk about, I, I guess, the, the larger question of who is paying the health bill. And, and the answer really is, whose bill is it? Um, we have the patient, we've got uh, the el eligible provider, which is, you know, the doctor hospital system. Uh, we then have uh, the vendors themselves, which are small vendors, the ones that we see here, some of the garage entrepreneurs. Uh, and we have the health insurance companies. And, and someone is paying the bill at each level. Uh, you know, if it's the patient, you know, obviously the patient themselves are most probably <coughs> buying some of these health information technologies because a lot of them are not covered. Um, you know, CMS has done an, abys an abysmal job of covering uh, telehealth services in the past, although there are shimmers of hope, right? This past summer, uh, they announced that they would be now covering smoking cessation, which is important. Um, they've done a lot with the CMS Innovation Center, um, which then takes me to the uh, eligible professional, the provider, the, the hospital and the doctor, who is paying their bill. Uh, a lot of doctors don't want to pay the bill, so that was the idea behind the um, health information technologies incentive funds that came out of the ARA. Um, that's, that's all well and good. Um, some parts of the industry are a little dismayed that they're not including uh, actual remote monitoring technologies just yet, but hopefully we'll see that in the second or third stages. Yeah, that's probably the third we'll, we'll stage. jump to that in a minute, right. We'll get to that. So, um, so then we've got those guys. And then, of course, we've got the health insurance companies, which you see now a lot more of strategic partnerships that are being formed, some acquisitions, which is very interesting. Mm. And then you get to the vendors. So you have some vendors, which are small vendors, small uh, entrepreneurs, the garage entrepreneurs that are developing these things and are trying to get seed money. Uh, some of them may have already gotten their seed money from angel investors and are now looking to get vendor financing. So with that in mind, uh, when we um, developed the vendor financing commitment of $100 million, um, we thought that it would be a good opportunity to try to find those uh, companies, uh, service providers, uh, and entrepreneurs that were interested in um, forming a partnership with Qualcomm with the idea of furthering uh, the, uh, the companies uh, that, that would be the, the subsidiaries' um, uh, first product line, which is the TuneNet hub and the TuneNet platform. So really the, the financing commitment is to um, work with companies that are going to be developing the ideals, the ideals behind TuneNet. And TuneNet is uh, you know, the development of transferring, storing, converting medical device data uh, for those medical devices that are out in the marketplace. Um, so that's really what we were focusing on. We've so, announced about five companies that you know, we're currently uh, funding. So I, want, I think we're going to spend most of the time on the, the stuff you were hitting on around insurers and CMS and you know, the big yeah. payers. That's clearly where we've got to go to in the end. But let's just spend a second, because you and also uh, um, Joe have been involved in this, on this issue of you know, where do we need early stage finance to get people, get companies up to scale ready to go. A lot of help, we have the continuum of folks you know, who are working on working on this as, as, as well, and obviously Qualcomm's heavily involved in that now. But uh, you guys are also involved in, in one of the incubators, Rock Health. There's a couple of new, brand new incubators, Blueprint, who just have been announced, and uh, Healthbox in Chicago. Um, there's a couple of private incubators and small other folks around in healthcare. There's a lot of action at the seed stage. We've had, I don't know how many companies apply to your conference, Joe. We have several hundred apply to Health 2.0 each year to come to talk about this. We've had uh, 
it's fun when the trains go by, isn't it? <laughs> We've had, uh, um, you're running, the, uh, Qualcomm's obviously involved in the, um, the, the challenge. There's a Health 2.0 working with ONC, is running the Health 2.0 developer challenge. Much smaller prices in the tens and hundreds of thousands, not in the ten millions, but nonetheless to help stimulate, you know, really early stage people developing applications. Where is it, you know, where is it that we need to get those companies up to speed so they can then go to scale and, that, and, and be appropriate for CMS? Is, do we have enough money coming to that stage, say, say, uh, that stage of the industry or not yet? I, I think that we do, but I, I, would, I would argue that most uh, small companies are, would, would argue that we're, we don't. Yep. Um, because whether it be the incubators <laughs> like, that you mentioned, um, there's another one called Startup Health, which uh, has, sure. has gone on New the map. City. Yep. Uh, those guys, but you know, we do work with Rock Health. Um, it, you know, Rock Health just announced, I, I believe, uh, 10 new uh, uh, financing commitments that they've done. Sure, the amount of money is, is low. Uh, I, I believe they fund at a, at a rate of about $50,000, and then there's a program for months where they work with these uh, uh, different uh, companies to try to get them up to quote unquote speed. I think, I think they're at 20. If, the, if you're, they're telling you 50, they're pocketing the 30. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's between 20 yeah, and 50,000, yeah. and it depends on the incubator. Yeah. But the idea is that uh, you know they would they would help these companies get up to speed. So to, who else is funding this? That's that's a great question. Um, which I think one of the things that CMS has tried to uh, focus on is this idea of innovation through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Um, so and I want to wrap this up because I want the other guys to get a chance here too. But really, um, when I see CMS announcing the $1 billion that they have allocated towards trying to um, foster innovation grants, you know, they, they're offering between $1 million and $30 million per grant. It's a three-year grant. The letters of interest were, were uh, um, the deadline was November 17th. Um, applications are now due on the 27th of this month, and the awards will be going out March 31st. That's a significant amount of money. You know, grants between $1 million up to $30 million for a $1 billion, it's a lot of money, and this may happen year after year. So I would venture to say that a lot of these small guys that are trying to get up there, they can apply for those type of funds. Because I think that that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of thing, the kind of entrepreneurship right. and innovation that CMS is looking for. So there is money out there, but it depends on how badly you want it and how badly you want to modify what you're doing to get at those monies. Because it's not going to be given to you just for nothing. So Joe, let me grab you in this stage because when we when I first interviewed you a few years back, you said that the uh, although Partners was basically a fee-for-service old world organization, the Center for Connected Health was set up because they knew that couldn't last forever. And you also, not only have you done, and you should say a word or two about the projects you've been doing, but also you've spun out a couple of companies, or one company at least I know. So say a bit about the, the philosophy about, about the Center for Connected Health, and then a bit more about uh, the, you know, this issue of funding and getting the early stage stuff off the ground within that kind of environment. Sure. Well, it's exciting to be part of this uh, panel <clears throat> and talk about who pays. I, I think the future is quite bright, actually, for who pays. And We'll get into that as the, as the hour goes on. The Center for Connected Health for 17 years has been creating programs that bring care out of the hospital and the doctor's office and directly into the lives of patients. And we rely heavily on monitoring, messaging, and communications technologies to achieve that vision. We've applied that concept to chronic illness largely, heart failure, diabetes, hypertension. We've seen two reproducible findings that keep coming up that are, again, quite exciting. One is the amazing capacity that individuals, in our case patients, but consumers as well, that those individuals have to actually manage their own health when you give them the right tools, the right information, the right insights, and Connected Health does that. So we see a tremendous opportunity and improve self-care as a way out of this abysmal state we're in in healthcare in the US. The second thing that keeps coming up is that providers can operate if we give them the right tools in a dashboard environment where they see a population in front of them, picture data streaming in real time. It's being looked at by software that calls out the relevant patients for a provider's view, and patients can make, uh, providers can make just-in-time care decisions. When we apply those concepts to chronic illness, we get really amazing results. Heart failure, in that program, we reduced our readmission rate by 50%. So again, when you talk about who's going to pay, those are, each one of those admissions is about $10,000 worth of shared savings. In 
Diabetes, we've lowered the rate for our diabetics, the A1C, about 1.5 percentage points, which again results, in, equates to about $10,000 per patient per year in savings. And in hypertension, 69% of our enrollees had a lower blood pressure reading at the end of a trial. We did on that particular intervention. We also do text messaging. We have a, pile, uh, sorry, a platform we've created where any patient can video conference in with freeware to our uh, physicians for virtual visits. And all these things are becoming quite real in the advent of accountable care and the way payment models are changing. So I think the future is quite bright. Now, so really, let me, let, me ask, let me ask you one question before we get to this. So tell, just tell us a bit about Health Rages and how the process of how that got funded out of Connected Health and sure. how that goes to the venture world, how that goes to scale. And then we're going to dive into the meat, exactly what you said is that how is payment going to change? So thanks for the lead in because that's where, that's where I was going next. Uh, we, we as a nonprofit healthcare system have a certain business that we can conduct, which is largely patient care, largely uh, reimbursed by third party payers, a variety of sorts. And at the center, we look as to innovate both on care model, but also on care delivery reimbursement. And about five years ago, we had a wonderful partnership with a storage company, EMC to see what we could do with Connected Health in the workplace. And that was a hypertension program as well that resulted in a significant lowering of blood pressure in the intervention group. And EMC came back and said they would be quite delighted to purchase that service as a service. We couldn't vend that service. Uh, and we saw a market for this in the health plan employer space. So we s licensed our software platform out and created Health Rages as a spin out of the center. Uh, they were featured yesterday, if any of you were here, in the Ford Motor presentation. So they're doing quite well at vending the connected health concept to health plans and employers. Another group, by the way, which I think are starting to pay for these services. Great, great. So let's then say, let's move to the world of, uh, and, and in about five minutes, I'm going to ask people to start lining up and uh, we'll shut up and uh, have a conversation with the audience. But um, let's move to the, to the world of the, of the people who could pay. Um, we've, you mentioned self-insured employers, uh, obviously insurers like United who have acres of grass and uh, trees downstairs to, you know, who are offering these services and a number of services they're either bringing in or or are creating themselves to offer these types of services to their employers, their customers. Um, and then obviously we have CMS, which is, you know, we're going to talk, talk with Robert a bit about that. But there's a, a third group who we've got to think about tapping into. A lot of it's happening at this show. It is called the Consumer Electronics Show. And uh, Bill, you represent a lot of consumers, <laughs> and they are not typically the, uh, the young kids who might be buying their 15th iPhone case or whatever else you can buy downstairs. So tell me a bit about what you've learned from some of the work you've done about... Uh, consumers' interest in these kinds of products for their health. Right. Well, ARP represents 37 million uh, Americans over the age of 50. And, and so to us, mobile health, the promise of mobile health is a no-brainer, right? Because our people tell us over and over again that their top concern as they age is, is staying independent, being able to age in place, right? And so here are devices coming onto the market that would enable that. But, you know, we're constantly taking the... Uh, the metaphorical pulse of our, our, our membership. And, and what they're telling us about mobile health is, you know, gee, this is interesting, but uh, why isn't my insurance company paying for this? This is just another medical device. You know, I'll be happy to, to kick in a copay or something like this, but, but my insurance company should pay. And so there's this disconnect between um, what they're telling us, I want to stay independent, but their willingness, willingness to pay. And so recently in November, we um, tapped one of our online communities. We have a number of, of these, and it was a small sample. It was only 300 people, but these are really sophisticated consumers. They're online, they know what they want, they're uh, ages 50 and up, and um, they represent um, our, our entire membership. They, um, and, and so instead of just asking them about mobile health devices, uh, as most polls did, we, we, we tried to explain what they are and what they do. We gave them pictures of things like glow caps and the wireless glucose monitors. And then we explained the value proposition. 
you know, if you have a, a Vitality Made Glow Cap, for example, it will alert you or your loved one when it's time to take a pill. And if you don't, it will send a message to an informal caregiver or a healthcare provider that something has gone wrong and you'll be contacted. And what was remarkable was um, the, the response we got from our people. They were like, oh my God, I didn't realize that existed. Yeah. Is that out there? And for, for people in you know, this room who go to conferences like this and have been seeing this technology for <laughs> years now, we're like, what are you talking about? We've been, you know, this stuff's been out there for years. But I think what, what maybe we all fail to realize is, is the low level of awareness among the general population. Yeah. I think particularly among the folks we represent who don't uh, instantaneously see a device and realize how it's going to enhance their lives. They see a device and say, oh, that's one more thing I gotta figure out. Mm -hmm. That's gonna complicate my life. Mm -hmm. And so what we realized when we did this research was not only was there a low awareness of the devices, but also a very low awareness of the value proposition, how it could really help. But the good news is that once we told them what these things could do, how they could enhance their lives, they were excited, they got it. They got it right away. And when we asked them then about their willingness to pay and their interest in these things, it went up dramatically. In Janu last January, we did a general poll of uh, informal caregivers over the age of 50. How interested are you in mobile health devices? You know, four out of 10 told us, oh, I'm interested in getting one of those. But once we explained the value proposition, showed them the picture and, and helped them understand the real value, it went up to six out of 10. If it was recommended by their doctor, it went up to eight out of 10. If they, could, uh, if they knew it was reliable and uh, interoperable, it was, it was eight out of 10. So I think what we have here isn't so much a, a, a lack of willingness to pay problem as much as it is an awareness problem on the part of consumers. So I think that's the first hurdle we have to, have to cross. No, that's dead right, I think. And, and uh, I was struck actually by something Amy Tendrich said here on the stage yesterday, which was that many of the type two diabetics who read their glucose meter don't know what that number means. I mean, talk about you know, lack of awareness, and that happens, by the way, on the clinician-physician side. So let's go back to the, uh, the reason why you know, Mass General and, and Brigham merged all those years ago, changing the payment system. Um, uh, I'm going to ask all three of you to jump in, and then, and then if you can start assembling <coughs> the questions, if you have them, or just conversations or general rants, please uh, come to the <laughs> mic. Um, we, uh, but uh, and I just want a quick soundbite from each of you. So I have a chart which I show in my deck, which is the payment system in 1998, and we did a whole bunch of, this is after the managed care revolution, kind of was when it was the height of it, and it basically showed that everyone was still being paid fee for service per transaction. If you went through the healthcare debate two years ago, you know that even the president understands that everyone gets paid fee for service per, by transaction, and that we don't have population-based payments, which would make sense for people to go, okay, for organizations to go, how do we figure out how to best serve the needs of this population, which we assume would encourage the kind of uh, devices and programs and services that uh, you've all been talking about. So give me your sort of, uh, I wanna go down the line here and give me your over under out of 10, how likely are we to see a significant change by both CMS and uh, big private payers, insurers, or other, to actually rewarding organizations that essentially do better rather than do more? So I'm gonna start with you, Robert. What do you, what do you think? I have a question back. What's the timeline? Uh, <laughs> well, the average company on the floor would like this to happen in about the next three months. Correct. But take, take the next five years. <laughs> next how, five years we're back in five years. Does this look different, or is it like, you know, we'll be back here in 20 years saying, well, we thought it was gonna happen again? Great, okay, so it, it looks, it'll look different in five years. Uh, how much different? I'd say 25% different. Yeah. So 20, so. 25, and I'd say that of the current outlay. So how many people here know what the budget is for Medicare and Medicaid? I'm assuming it's a very savvy crowd, so somebody throw out a number. Uh, uh, collective is 800? over here. Hey, correct, okay, so, uh, and I got the numbers written down here. So 2011, the budget for Medicare was 549 billion. The overall total budget for Medicare and C uh, for CMS, including things not Medicare and Medicaid, was $911 billion. It went down this year to 892 billion total. Uh, Medicare alone is five, $548 billion. Okay, so I'd say 25% of the, that figure, you know, which is obviously gonna change in five years, I, I think is gonna change in the sense that that fee-for-service model will now be predicated on quality improvements, health information technologies, and uh, you know, improving care through outcomes as opposed to just paying for stuff stupidly. 
So, Joe, we go to you. Is, does partners believe the same, believe it more, believe less? Well, in Massachusetts, really, we're already there, Matthew. We, we, uh, but you do have the most expensive healthcare in the world in Massachusetts as well. We're, <laughs> so maybe we should be there. Uh, <laughs> but, but we are. So, so uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield has been with a, out with a product uh, for, for a couple of years now called uh, Alternative Quality Contract. Essentially, most providers, if not all in the state, are signed up for that now. We at Partners are going to be in a uh, Pioneer ACO, uh, and there's tilt. When you get somewhere around 40% of your revenue coming in as bundled payments or, or uh, where you're going at risk for that revenue, you have to manage the whole organization that way. It's too schizophrenic to not. So we're, yes, I mean, exactly what you said. We're, we're investing in population health management. Connected Health is going to get an uptick in, in our implementations. and and we'll be there, uh, we'll be paying the bill. So I want to make that point, uh, and lest I forget it, that healthcare providers will be part of the who pays in five years. We're very much on the leading edge here on this, but it will happen. And the reason is, in a value-based payment model, which is where we're going, you adopt these things as business expenses because you are rewarded on efficiency and quality as opposed to volume. <clears throat> That's a fundamental important change and as providers start to realize that at the ground level, they all of a sudden become very interested in this stuff. Virtual visits, let me add it. Mo monitoring, what can it do for me? And it's all because they're being, they're being compensated now uh, at a bundled level for efficiency and quality as opposed to volume. So, Bill, answer yeah, that I, question, then I have another one for you yeah, about DC. So. I, I mean, I'd love to be as optimistic as, as Joe is, but I think that um, we're not really going to have a good insight into this until this summer when, this, when the uh, Supreme Court takes up the health care <laughs> reform law. Because I think if that is struck down or dismantled or unraveled to some degree, it, it sets back a lot of these payment uh, reforms that have been put into place. Now, I think, I think what Joe is is doing in Massachusetts is going to continue apace, but I don't think it's going to have the same momentum nationally that it otherwise would if the health care reform law uh, is struck down. And one other thing I'd like to say is I, I think um, when Robert talked about the uh, CMS innovation grants, I mean, I actually read that. I, I'm an optimist there because I read that as a signal from CMS that they're not just trying to help small startups, but they're trying to contribute to the evidence base here. You know, they, they want to, to feed money. They, they realize that a linchpin of uh, payment is going to be a sufficient evidence base to demonstrate efficacy here. And I think uh, my read on these grants is that they are trying to develop that evidence base so then they have something to go to Congress with to say, look, we want to we wanna, uh, we wanna start paying for some of these devices, and here's, here's the ROI. So let me, can I respond, actually? You both, yeah, go on, shout both of you. No, well, not a shout I, of wins. so I want to, I want to, I'm not sure on this, but I believe, so it's a question as much as a response. But the Supreme Court decision is about whether you as an individual should have to pay for insurance. It isn't about this, all of this innovation coming out of CMS, of which accountable care organizations are a part. And I think they can be decoupled, and I don't think they're going to go back. They, they don't. They don't really have a choice. Oh. So. I agree. Yeah, I, I agree with Joe. And there's just so much evidence that started, and I don't mean evidence as in the sense of evidence of medicine and scientific breakthrough, but I mean evidence from CMS that they really have um, gone into. Uh, they've they've opened the door, and the the, the foot is in the door. Uh, of innovation, and that started really with ARA, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. It was, you know, arguably 30 billion to 40 billion that was really devoted to health information technology and broadband uh, technology opportunity programs for, you know, rural healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I'm being very optimistic that in the next five years, the budget for CMS is going to change, but it, it has to. It has to, and with so many new congressmen that are actually doctors that are really fighting to make these huge, significant changes, with CMS adopting, embracing the ideas of we have to reduce hospital stays, we have to reduce readmissions, um, with so much language in CMS itself for the CMS Innovation Center, I mean, sure, 10 billion over 10 years, which is what it's, the funding is for, is a drop in the bucket, obviously, of their overall budget, but it's there, uh, and I think it's really significant. Um, so how much will change in the next five years? You know, I, I think I made a pretty bold prediction. 25% of that budget should change in the next five years. And this goes back to something that we were talking about here, which is, you know, patient engagement and, and adherence and understanding of these technologies. 
you know, it's funny, uh, there's a, a, a tech guy uh, who, uh, an analyst, his name is Andy Siebold, who used to speak at CTIA, and he said, you know, voice is the killer app. Uh, this is going back about five, to actually 10 years ago. Voice is a killer app. There's nothing out there that I've seen that's data driven that is the killer app. And now we see that data is everything. It really has changed, yeah, so it takes really time, is. you know. So let me jump in, just, uh, and we'll go to your question in one second, sir, but um, your three second sound bite here, Bill and Joe. Uh, here's my question. Are, I've been muted. E e e even, no, e e even if we believe the, mon the money changes, around. we have to change the culture a bit. Uh, consumers ready, doctors ready. Um, are consumers ready for a... For, for the change that's going to come in this payment that's going to say you're dealing with your health care in a different way. If you go back to the managed care revolution, right. they weren't ready I, and doctors weren't ready. Yeah, I think it depends on which consumers you're talking about. I think at the higher age, I think it's a generational issue to some degree. I think at the higher uh, age, age cohorts that we represent, I, I think they tend to have a very paternalistic view of medicine and they, wanna, they want their doctor to handle everything. I think our folks who are aging, in, you know, the baby boomers are saying, no, give it to me, I want to control it. So I think uh, it depends. So, doctors? They killed the loss. You know, we just we just did a so again our, our delivery system is is on the front end of this, but we just did a survey, and eighty percent of our primary care doctors were either using a connected health solution in their practice or ready to use one within a year. So, I, again, and I say that partly because we've been at it seventeen years, but also the payment model is changing. It really does make a big difference. Uh, question, comment from the audience there. Uh, yes, yeah, so this, this is John Kuhn. Uh, I'm the publisher of Medical Electronic Device Solutions magazine. I have uh, one question for Robert and one question for Joe. So first question is, um, you mentioned about uh, Qualcomm is funding uh, startups or companies. What types of companies are you looking for and, and what kind of criteria do you have to fund those companies? Sure. So we're looking for those companies that are involved in chronic disease management, in uh, health, fitness, well-being. It's, it's really it's a very broad general category. It's company by company. Um, it is a venture financing uh, arm. Um, you know, we treat it as a venture capital wing of Qualcomm. We have a, a much larger venture capital uh, fund, which this comes from, it's derived from. Um, but really, it will be company by company. I have a contact, and I can give you that contact if you approach me after this, uh, um, after this panel discussion. Sure. And I presume that some of those companies will be making devices. It could Correct. Be, right? it's sensors. It's really Boxing. predicated on sensors, but you know, apps are wonderful too. There are a number sure. of partners of Qualcomm Life that are, are rooted in strictly uh, being applications and being cloud-based services. So again, it's very broad. Uh, it's open to you know, any idea. Um, but again, it's rooted in the idea that this will advance the interests of Qualcomm Life and the TuneNet platform and the TuneNet hub, which are the first two products from Qualcomm Life. All right. Thank you. So, uh, question for Joe now. So, let's say a company uh, gave you a propose, give you a proposal, and got this funding, and still start designing this great product. And then this company said, "Okay, I, this product will solve all kinds of problems." But then they worry about it. Even though they have the best product, who's going to pay for it? Right? Will insurance uh, pay for this thing? So they come to Joe and say, "Okay, Joe, can, does your organization help?" those companies to work with, uh, will this product get reimbursed by somebody? And if, or what kind of advice do you have to those companies as they go down the path of inventing or developing these products? Yeah, th okay. Thanks so much for asking. So our center does do consulting of the very type you mentioned. We, we've helped a number of companies get products uh, market ready and connected health from product testing to, uh, to strategic advice, all the way to randomized controlled trials that show their value in the marketplace. Uh, and so, yes, we would be uh, pleased to, to hear from firms who have those kinds of questions, and we can help. But you're also expecting, as you said earlier, partners organizationally to be paying. We'll eventually be a, be a customer, absolutely. We'll be a customer well. as well, yes. And I'm sure many other, you know, the Kaisers and other That's ACAs right. will too. Next question, sir. Hi, I'm Michael Galelli from Health Interventions. A question for Joe. Uh, in your connected health model, either today or in, and even going forward, how do coaches figure into it, especially non-professional coaches? Uh, that's a uh, can, can, I, can I add to that question? It's a great question, and that's inclined to something you've mentioned, which is around <clears throat> the organizational payment for who is looking at the dashboard. Because I think we talked ages ago about the changing role of a primary care mm -hmm. doc and how they maybe should only be seeing a patient three hours a day and 
managing a team, but you know, let's face it, when most of us go out and see our primary care docs, unless we're perhaps a Kaiser member, there's no organization like that for them. So add coaches and other stuff into that mix. How does that play out? How do you organize that? Well, you can think about, I mean, there's two questions. So let me, th th let me address the role of coaches first. So coaching is incredibly important. Uh, let me say this, that data coming from sensors uh, into a personal health record or an electronic record is kind of almost useless without the coaching component. What we spend a lot of time in our center now in our research is understanding what motivates individuals, how we can present that information to someone in a context that will motivate them to achieve a healthier outcome themselves. So we have a, a research component that pushes the limits on when you can be your own coach. How can we set up systems that encourage you to be your own coach? We have virtual coaches that we employ. We have text messaging campaigns that serve a coaching function. We have non-physician clinicians that can be coaches. Wellness coaches can participate in this model. Uh, nurses, and then sometimes a doctor. And the answer to your question, Matthew, is those other labor components will fold in nicely because right now we expect a doctor, the highest paid person, to do everything. And so we get, give that individual, because we can't train any more of them any faster and the demand for services going through the roof, give them the things that they're trained best to do and, and have these other folks who are uh, more efficient labor sources do some of these other things. So I want, I want to push you a bit on that. This is back to the cultural thing, actually, for, for both of you two gents. And probably, actually, I don't know, uh, Robert, if you've been to your clinic, the Qualcomm clinic that's in San Diego, you probably then never go to home base. But, yeah. you know, we, we are saying to people, you're going to do things in a different way. And we know that, you know, if you look at the Fortune 500, what it was, the top companies on the stock market from the 1930s, so the top companies on the stock market. Now, they're all really different. Mm. But if you look at the big medical systems from the 30s and the 1900s and the 1890s, and now, they're all basically the same organizations, right? Yeah. There's still Blue Cross Blue Shield, which was started in the 30s. We, we're not an industry which likes changing, which likes understanding. And we have a very, very deep culture in what we do. And, you know, I have a, a, a colleague somewhere out in the audience hall uh, on the show today, a guy called Bart Foster at Solo Health, who is putting diagnostic devices in the end of the, 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 the counter of, of Walgreens and Walmart and, uh, you know, the Safeway, where you can go and get all kinds of diagnosis and get it kicked to a doctor. And it's a very, you know, that into the world that we've had for more than 150 years of primary care doctors doing everything. It's a really big change. How, how are we helping doctors to do that? How's that happening? And then after you replied, Joe, Bill, how are we changing, you know, how, how are consumers getting used to that? Especially the small percentage who are very sick, who, you know, who tend to be elderly, who account for most of the cost. <coughs> Well, the small percentage that are very sick that tend to be elderly are probably the right ones to put in front of doctors, <laughs> okay. right? Seriously. But then there's, I mean, golly, all the things that you go, drive a couple of hours, park your car, wait in a waiting room, wait in a cold room with a gown on for something that's of very little value, we can remove all of that. That's all waste. And we can change it to high value transactions that are in the moment when they're needed using this kind of a model. Uh, so I, I think that's both the answer to solving the savings a, as well as who's going to pay because it will uh, naturally un, unfold in that way. Now, yeah, those disruptive innovations you mentioned will happen. My, my favorite current one to use as a thought model is retail clinics because they're working. Mm -hmm. And, and we th that was going to be disruptive, but you know, pretty much our primary care doctors haven't noticed the difference because they were busy as heck anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that amount of primary care has gone away. They're still busy. There's, there's so much, there's, there's so little uh, primary care labor in the system compared to the amount of demand. You can continue to take things away for a while before people start to hurt. Yeah, and I think, I think it's interesting you mentioned the retail clinics because I think their success is premised on people's desire to have more convenient access, access. to their health care, right? right? and not have to wait 30 days for an appointment and sit in a waiting room. And so I think people are really motivated for, for what these devices have to offer. So let me push you a bit on that one, and then I'll, <coughs> I'll ask Robert to which, it, which is the, the issue of how motivated are people. I, a personal experience, this my, I have a little baby. I just went through uh, the whole bit of going to see an OBGYN, fancy part of San Francisco, 
this was the electronic record. I mean, there was no electronic record. I, I have a joke. I actually was wearing the T-shirt of a company that sells an in-office freezer, a company that sells an in-office pad to check yourself in. And I actually held up the clipboard and had someone take a photo of me and put it on my blog and said, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and there seemed to be, and yet my wife, who obviously chose her, didn't seem to care enough to like, move her business to somebody, who, to, to a, somebody who, who had an EMR and did it in a different way. How, how, you know, are we going to, are consumers going to be followers here or, or I mean, the desire of convenience is, is good, but how much are they prepared to change the actual bond with their current doctor? Well, I mean, you're referencing the, the whole PHR debacle and, <laughs> and I mean, people, I mean, that's a problem and people just don't see the value in, in, in popular that. They have to see the value in, in the service that would be delivered. But I, I can't mean people complain like hell about filling in that clipboard again and you know there's no reason why that shouldn't have gone away years ago. There are companies right. out there supplying that and even that little thing has <coughs> taken time to spread in and hasn't sp you have an audience poll. Last time you went to the doctor who, who did not fill in a clipboard? <laughs> <laughs> Two, not. Four people use an electronic people. system that's everyone amazing. else fill in the clipboard yeah. right basically so I mean that's the right, kind so of thing. Here, well here's well, the opposite side of that is you know I have a PHR I go to my doctor, I say, I got a PHR, and he says, oh, I'm sorry, I can't read that. <laughs> you know, yeah, so, yeah. so well, even, I mean, if, even if you are, uh, even if a consumer is highly motivated and early adopter, the, the physician may not be ready to receive it. Right. Um, it, it. One of the biggest complaints I have of the ONC and of meaningful use and of the Health Information Technologies Incentives Program is that it does nothing to incentivize actual patient engagement um, because the products, the sensors, the applications that are actually touching the patient are not included in the criteria for meaningful use. You know, it's all about clinical requirements and clinical de decision support requirements, which is perfectly fine, foundational, I get it. Um, but the, the rich pearls of data coming off of each and every one of us get lost in a manila folder, which then has to be transcribed uh, or, uh, you know, yeah, so I would defend the current, the, the previous and current ONC leadership a bit because I think what, when it actually came out of Congress, all the EMR, big, big R and EMR vendors thought they were just getting a straight grant and were a bit surprised they had to do anything called meaningful use and, uh, and when it actually came down in phase two and phase three, Hopefully, if you guys do your job properly, we'll actually get more of, <laughs> make, make sure that that consumer yeah, stuff gets agreed. advocated. But, but that's the issue, right? For phase two, um, they, they have it in the matrix as a proposal for actually stage three. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. So, which means, again, that in the next fight of the apple, out. which is this year, you know, it's, it's still not there. So that, that's an issue. But going back to um, engagement and even uh, you know, within our companies, for example, Qualcomm, you mentioned the, um, the facility that we have. Um, we really have um, retooled that facility to try to um, really concentrate more on wireless. You know, we're a wireless company. We're about wireless and about bringing wireless and, and good use of wireless home. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, that the subsidiary did, Qualcomm Life, was um, while it was developing its product over the past year, they launched a corporate fitness challenge which was just between the group that was working um, on, on launching the subsidiary. And it was, it was really very highly successful. Um, I, I forget how many, but I believe it was a, a million calories were burned in the matter of eight weeks amongst all the participants. And there were about 30 or 40 participants. But people took it very seriously. And, and at the core of that were wireless devices, a withing scale, a body media uh, unit that could speak with a phone. It's amazing how people embraced it so mm. quickly uh, and really became a part of it. You, everybody could see their numbers. People were really making jokes over email. It was really quite, quite useful. And I think that that's going to be the model by which HealthRageous and other uh, companies are really going to embrace this stuff. You know, yeah. once people know how to use it, it's like having a can opener for a ton of cans. If you don't want to have the can opener, you ain't, you're not going to access, access the food. Don't, yeah, don't, that's great. Don't <laughs> underestimate the value of objective information. It's really powerful. Yeah. Right, we have five minutes left, and I see at least two questions there. Oh. This is Bettina from uh, Excellent um, from Humetrics. Hi, Bettina. Hi. So Bettina, expert on uh, CEO of Humetrics. And Robert, in fact, I would like to comment on an earlier point you made about the CMMI grant. This uh, innovation call for a proposal from CMS is really targeted to uh, new delivery and payment models. So it's more uh, for organizations like Connected Health or Partners Healthcare to respond, even if the infrastructure, the new infrastructure they call for has to heavily rely on new information 
technology solution. And then when you talked about patient engagements, indeed the ONC is catching on. The stage two meaningful use, even stage one call for patient engagement as a critical meaningful use criteria for physicians to meet when they use electronic medical records. And back to funding and call for innovation, I would like Matthew to tell, to tell us a little bit more about what the ONC calls and uh, for innovation in their I2 industry innovation challenge, which the ELS 2.0 organization manage. Uh, Umetrix was one of the awardees, but uh, the ONC indeed is looking at tools for patients to be engaged and to have, in our instance, safer transition of care between the hospital and the home and in between every point of care a given patient may stop by? Well, just, just to quickly answer that question. Um, so ONC is doing a lot of stuff. Uh, Rajiv Riccardi is running a consumer division there under mm -hmm. Fazem Mostashari, the head, the head of the whole thing. And there's a lot of activity around getting consumers involved. The particular thing that Bettina's referencing, which Humetrics uh, was an award winner in, uh, was a challenge run, which Health Tubular runs for ONC under the, something called the I2 program, which I think was a 40000 maybe $50,000 prize challenge for stuff built over about uh, uh, three months. And that was the, the, the goal there was to develop applications which help safe transitions and yeah, improve transitions. And care. So that's one yeah. you know, huge area. And by the way, I think we have 15 coming out over the next year. So it's a lot more where that came from. And it's sort of like a smaller scale, more rapid fire version of the big sort of uh, X prize. I mean, there's a lot of innovation around prizes. So I, I think there's a lot of activity innovation that ONC is stimulating. I, I regard it as a great force for good as well. I'm self-interested because I, I, I work in that area. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, so having said that, but, it, but it, is a, uh, it, it is an area in which, you know, I think there's a lot of innovation again, but let's get the, 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 the point we're getting back to is that it hasn't yet been um, moved into the forefront. If it were at 25% in five years, it's going to take a while for, for it to be kind of accepted or that's not even the wrong word. At what point, are you, if you're not proposing to somebody they should take on a personal center, should join an online community, or should have some device, some uh, record of their care transitions, are you committing malpractice? That's kind of what we need to get it to in the culture. So yeah. we had uh, one more question, <coughs> Colin? One more question. Yes, my name is Gay Bach. I'm with Excel Venture Management. And I would just like to hear from the panel, and particularly um, Joe, um, what, how do you think about the change at the end of last year that physicians can now be reimbursed for obesity counseling? And, and does that create or drive a new uh, payment stream for, or, or demand for some of the um, innovations here? So, so I'll start briefly by saying I think it's fabulous. Obesity is what we, what we call a, a uh, on-the-fence condition. Is it a wellness problem? Is it a sickness? And uh, for many, many years, it was viewed as a wellness problem. And most of my physician colleagues didn't have any real strategy around it. So what that, uh, what you referred to has created the opportunity to get physicians more involved. I think that's a good thing. So um, we have two and a half minutes left. I want to do the real rapid fire. And we, you just raised something that's very interesting, which is are we, I was asking more about changing the way we pay in general. But there's another way of changing things, which is to get traditional fee-for-service Medicare had to pay for stuff it hadn't paid before, and obesity is one of them. Telehealth has been a big battle. Um, let me ask the question kind of, of, of the rest. Let's say Robert's right, it's 25% of the Medicare, and let's just call it 25% of the private budget over the next five years, tracks and becomes sort of ACO, population management, of the rest, of the rest of the healthcare budget, even if that's, the, you know, that, is there going to be a big enough change in the kind of stuff that gets paid for that the devices on the show downstairs, the services that go around them, those teams of people who are currently not paid for to look at the dashboards, is that going to change? Or are we just depending on, is the industry here depending on the, 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 leading, the leading edge and or consumers prepared to pay out of pocket? So rapid fire, you guys get uh, 30 seconds each to tell me your answer and then we're done. I'll start. Uh, won't change. It'll take an act of Congress. <laughs> Durable medical equipment is still uh, light years away from uh, being considered the things that we see here. I mean, I think CMS still doesn't even reimburse for it for software, if you can believe that. So, I agree. I mean, I, I think that changing Medicare is, is a really high mountain to climb, especially in this climate where Congress is looking to uh, save money from all of the entitlement programs. So I think they're going to be loath to take some, some risks uh, in Medicare. The, the, the days of, of kind of going to get a code, either a regional 
new code or going to the coverage and analysis group, I think, are over for this kind of stuff. And it's got to be uh, shared savings, bundle payments, and the like. So that, I group, that's, that's, and it's your number higher than, uh, than uh, uh, Robert's 25%. And then let me ask you about the private side. Um, we didn't really talk much about self-insured employers, but ins insurers who are working with them, are they going to stay at 25% or are they going to go more to uh, the kind of ACO type bundle payment model? Well, they're, they're, try, they're trying like crazy, again, in Massachusetts to hold us accountable for quality and, and efficiency, and we're, we're participating. We, we just, Partners Healthcare just redid all of, voluntarily, it redid all of our contracts with our payers so that we could align our incentives. So, for what that's worth. And more globally, uh, Bill and Robert, what are you seeing on the private side on the conjunction? Yeah, I, I agree. Side? I think what we're seeing is just the beginnings of the payer community beginning to embrace this. I mean, they're, you, I mean you said the same companies have been around for so long. They were risk averse group, but I think they're realizing the, the potential payoff of, of some of these devices. Just like what we were talking about earlier, um, it, there are so many providers, eligible providers, it's the, the term, the, the term of art, for doctors and, and, and even hospitals to embrace electronic health records and health information technologies. Um, that, that has to change, and by, by law, it must change, otherwise they forfeit Medicare, Medicaid payment in the future. Um, so I think that that is step one, and with that change, I think it'll herald a very a vast change uh, amongst providers in the next five years. Tough, but they, they have to embrace health information technologies by then, or, or again, they, they forfeit their money. So I would close with one comment, which is if you look at a pretty interesting investor um, presentation from Aetna in December, they bought a, a consumer company called iTriage, um, and they also said that they believe that they, Aetna, big insurance company, is going to go over, the, they think the ACM model is going to take over and they're going to be dealing, they're going to be supplying services to, mm -hmm. you know, organizations like an ACO, uh, a partner's ACO or what have you. And, you know, maybe the private side will actually wake up. I mean, I hope so, we'll wake, because they control a lot of the activity, we'll wake up and drive a lot of activity here. And I think, given that folks like Aetna and United and others are, are interested in this, we have got, you know, if I were to be optimistic, I'd be optimistic there, I'd be optimistic about the Medicare Innovation Fund and, you know, I understand the rest of it gets controlled by Congress and who knows. And with that, I want to uh, thank very much Jacob Adar, Bill Walsh, Robert Jaron, and uh, you for listening in. And uh, thanks so much, Joe. Thank you.